Hi, thank you for joining Suzanne and Zena. And this is Kim. And we've got Sebastian listening in today. We were just mentioning PRP today. So um, just having Kim had asked a question, uh, sent me an email asking about PRP. And so I was just giving her a little bit of information and I'm hoping that I'll get a doctor in to actually explain to everybody in greater detail more and more about PRP. So I will send a message out when I have that um, information of when maybe she can do a little talk or maybe I can just record a little interview with her, which I think would be really valuable. So um, great. The other topic that I had in mind for today was to talk about um, hip osteoarthritis in a younger population. Uh, and especially in the hypermobile, maybe more could be dance related or could just be pure hypermobility population because we seem to have a lot of uh, hypermobility lately with our clients that we're working with um, and difficulty with them having a, a difficulty activating muscles and getting correct muscles firing versus just generally working through a Pilates routine without ever getting those muscles on. So um, I thought I could I'll, I could present the, one of the case studies that I'm working with. And then if you guys want to contribute, unless there's any other case study questions that you wanted to bring up before I dive in. You know, I'll reveal something. I actually had a PRP injection last week. Some more oh, week great. Yeah, so I've had them before. Are you considering getting one, Kim? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have that that need right now. But it's more about um, related to a couple of clients I'm working with. You know, one had had them in her knees, another had them in her hips, and you know, the clients. You know, they're taking direction from the doctor too. But I just wanted to understand more about what what they should and shouldn't do, and and for how long, and how long does the PRP last, and. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> so, those are all good questions. Yeah. Um, so, you um, have you worked a lot with PRP, Zena? So, I've worked with quite a few clients um, who have had PRP injections, um, and I've talked to a couple doctors about the differences in the treatment post PRP injection. Um, mostly the people who I've worked with are because of that hypermobile joint segment, the knees, the client that Kim's talking about, I also know, um, it was more for cartilage, trying to maintain cartilage, um, in her knees, the other client with the hip. And she also actually, if it's, if I'm thinking of the same client that also had injections in the rib, thoracic spine and ribs for hypermobility issues. Um, and that was an interesting case because she was also working with a chiropractor at the same time and doing physical therapy and doing Pilates. And so her chiropractor was sort of had decided that her ribs got too stiff. Some of the joints were too stiff after the PRP injection and was mobilizing the ribs. I worked with her more on stability for the hip post injection. And I think that's what Kim's doing a little bit now with her more is the hip stability. Her pain levels definitely did go down in that case, um, but it was hard. Her hip took a while, which is reasonable. She had a few rounds of injections, I think two or three rounds of injections there. So I'd be curious to know what your experience is so far and um, if you wanted to share that. Sure, I've had a number of them. Um, so I had a left uh, dislocated fibula. I would say, well, I shouldn't say dislocated, it was sublux, you know. Um, and that healed completely, but it did take me about maybe three years to rehab mm -hmm. the whole thing. Um, I hurt my meniscus on the right, and um, but then in the next year I had a labeled tear on the right hip. So, you know, it was hard to determine. I was you know, having trouble just kind of getting the whole situation under control. Um, I do a huge amount of um, rehab on my own, you know, as we all do, yeah. right? <laughs> and I think it is. It might, I think it's really hard for clients, you know, but. Um, but I'm not too sure, you know, I, I have um, generalized hypermobility. I don't know that I have a pathological amount of it, um, but, uh, 
but you know, I, I'm older too. So, I mean, I have degeneration, so I'm trying to stem uh, the disease progression, but I had a lot of actually psoas, um, tendinosis, you see. So I kept saying it feels more, much more like the tendons. And so I've had this really helpful acupuncturist here. I just moved to the East Coast. And so I'm in Georgia now. And he has done an enormous amount of what I would call friction massage on my adductor tendons. And that has helped me enormously. And so then that has shown the true range, because I think that's true. I think it's any kind of injection is going to give us scar tissue. You know, it's going to close down. I mean, I think that's what happened with my knee to begin with, is that, you know, it had like a reaction to it. I think as movement educators, it's difficult, you know, to know exactly what to do and like when to intervene, especially since people who to have some hypermobility, we take longer to heal. You know, it often takes me a couple of years, Kim, you know, to try to encourage them that, I don't, you know, that it, it can take a, a while. I always tell people when they come to work with me, I say, look, this is the two-year program, you know, and not that people have to marry me, but, you know, it's, we work long-term with people and, uh, and it mm-hmm. takes a village, you know, it, it helps to have a lot of different providers. But I will say mm-hmm. this, one thing that, um, and Kim, are you a PT? No, a Pilates instructor. Oh, that's for, okay, for that's Dana. okay. But I'll tell you this, it was interesting because, uh, and for you too, Zena, is that uh, I've been studying the Steco method of like fascial manipulation, which is, uh, you know, that we know the Tom Meyer stuff and that's accessible to us. Mm-hmm. And then the Stecos are, are like super heavy anatomists. So they take like Tom Meyer stuff and go to almost like microscopic level, you know, they do. Yeah. And so one of the things that um, it turns out that a person I had studied with is in this location and I was having a really hard time opening up, you know, my hip abduction, abduction and things. And it was giving me this like outrageous pain to move just mm-hmm. in simple abduction, just with like pelvic press on the reformer, you know, just kind of clearing out that joint and getting the pathways right. And so I went to him um, last, about a week or so ago, fortunately it was before the PRP. And I said, and he said, look, you've had so much work done in your hip. We're not gonna work on that. I said, fine. And I gave him, you know, you know how we are. I could give him like a really itemized list of all my past injuries from 12 years old. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, oh, they yeah. Was, they was, uh, a saying called old is gold. And honestly, he, um, he friction massaged the outside of my right heel. I thought I was going to pass out. And then he went into my shoulder because I have some scoliosis and I, I did have a frozen shoulder, but this is my winging one. I thought I was going to pass out. My hip range improved like by 30, 35 degrees. So, I mean, I was like, okay, I don't know if that's permanent. You see what I mean? Like we have to do the work then to Mm -hmm. fill that in, you know? And so I went to see my acupuncturist today. I said, look, I don't do anything on the hip. And he goes, he's so funny. He doesn't speak real good English. He says, oh yeah, yeah, must rest, must rest. I said, look, I had dental work. Let's work on that. So, you know, because I know that that's also associated, right? With the sacral, we all know everything's connected. So, you know, I think it is encouraging our clients to, to not go crazy because, you know, sometimes I think they can be just grasping at straws when maybe it, it is too late. This is sort of my last ditch effort to see, you know, is it really something that I can get by with, you know? Um, but I'm convinced, you know, that I have a, a shot at it and I'm using imagery into the hip, thinking of the cartilage, you know, in terms of... Um, walking and stuff and actually trying to think of the, of just like, you know, those, those things, those garden features where there's like this continually rolling like marble ball and this kind of water. (laughs) So I'm trying to have those kinds of images when I'm walking and stuff and even doing our exercises to go really somatic. So, um, you know, I, I think not every client can handle that, but you know, it's like, trying to encourage them to, you know, to go deep and that just to see yeah. what can happen. Mm, yeah. 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 So I don't know, that might be TMI, but I think it's really odd because I usually don't get in on your things. And one time I think I emailed you really cranky saying, I, I miss, I this blah, blah, blah. and you're like, you know, yeah. it's there. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's great information. I mean, I think this is, this has been a journey with both the clients that Kim has been talking on about, I think a lot um, happens around fear too. And maybe, you know, they've been in so much pain for so long and maybe that was similar to some of your experience having long-term injuries, but that then there becomes this protectiveness around the, the joints centralization. Too. Yeah. 
So then I'm, I, it is, it's true. Like I, I know, cause even I went to my gynecology appointment, like if that guy isn't listening, is that, you know, even she took my legs open. I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's like, she's just a Marin hippie, you know I mean? So it's like, she's not like some aggressive babe, big babe or something, but you know, to get past that, like, oh, I'm anticipating this is going to send me through the roof, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I um, and I think there's so much more work to be studied and done around the fascia and the way that that connects and holds and guards based on not just on the physical, but also on the somatic, like you were saying, there's so much uh, more. I keep learning more and more and more about how that is interrelated and how much one of my favorite phrases, and this is, I, I find especially true with my cervical patient. I find cervical patients have a lot of fear around the pain yeah. yeah they're very guarded and painful um so i do a lot of work with them just on the you know and some of them it's too much like you were saying it's too much but i'll do a lot of work with them on you know if you can if you can um hang on with me for a second and if you can just take a breath in and breathe that air out and try and just uh, say it's okay like it's okay that i have pain in my neck it's okay and I can let go of this a little bit, the more you can relax into what your neck is doing and telling the, the faster you're going to feel better. And I think some people can take that and some people can't, but I just to say that I think there's a lot of relationship between the fascial connection and the fear of pain. So, and I see this in the hypermobile population a lot who I think tend to be the people we're seeing with more of the PRP injections at this point hypermobile and then cartilage um, damage. The younger ones, for example, one of the ones that Kim is talking about is, is in her, just turned 50, I think, right around there. So yeah, or maybe a little less. Um, Are you hypermobile? But me, I am totally hypermobile. Yeah. And you Kim? No. Kim's yeah. up. Because, you know, I, I'm convinced I have, you know, I mean, thank God that I don't think it's a full-blown thing, but I, I definitely think there's some sort of autoimmune um, sensitivity, um, yeah. or, you know, heightened uh, synovitis or, you know, um, mm -hmm. that is great because like, you know, I, I love being able to feel everything, you know, but it's like, um, it's not so great all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm doing a um, balanced body um, on tour next week and they wanted me to do a fashion hypermobility. And I connected mm -hmm. a little bit just to the stecco mm -hmm. stuff, you know, because I had such this um, <laughs> great reaction. But, uh, you know, it, I, I think that um, it's such a challenge. And some of the people that I've worked with, and they look me up, Kim, because, because uh, you know, since I've written about it and taught about it, and mm -hmm. people have like the systemic problems, you know, some of them with, you know, with fatigue and, um, just uh, can't get through a day. It's with this fibromyalgia, you know, kind of almost mm -hmm. aspect, chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, well, they manifest in so many ways, as you know. And, and then mm -hmm. we are lucky enough to be in a therapy world, you know, the therapeutic world in our movement, mm -hmm. you know, world where we can try to navigate all that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a huge service that we can do um, to try to give, you know, hope to this population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I agree. And I think also I was going to add to that, what you just said, Suzanne, that there's a lot of systemic autoimmune plus, I think a lot of gut issues that go along. A lot of yeah, people with- all the, the connective tissue in the gut. Yeah. All the connective tissue in the gut. Your bowel. That's and, good. Yeah. So I think um, there's definitely a lot, but that's, that's great that you're doing the talk. Maybe I'll look it up too and maybe jump in on that with you. Um, you know, I've taken advantage of this time, just like you're doing right now. And I studied something called heart-centered therapy. Um, mm -hmm. That was a little much for me, but you know, it, it was, it, it's wonderful mm -hmm. stuff. I'm not sure that's exactly where I want to take my clients because it's super heavy trying to also get into, um, into giving like a physical look to where your pain area is. Oh, um, without just explaining the anatomy and actually without explaining your, the history behind it. And it is very effective. Um, and, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's heavy duty stuff. And, um, so 
you know, that's just it is that, uh, you know, these early, either early traumas or everybody's got stuff, right? You know, just things you've been through, even if you were offended as a kid by some other bully in the class, you know, <laughs> just, you know we all have it, so. Yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing all of that about your own personal experience. Um, should we go, would you like to talk about the hypermobility, hip osteoarthritis in the younger, or is there another topic case study that is better, more interesting for you guys? Everything's always interesting to me, but you know, I do have to tell you that I have a client, so I'll have to get off like about a quarter to the hour. Yeah. Okay, no problem, yeah. Kim, did you have a particular one that you wanted to discuss or a particular topic? No, no, I mean, okay. the PRP, yeah, which we've, yeah. we've talked about and we'll talk about some more. We'll talk about tomorrow. I will definitely, I'm going to see if she can come and join us. Um, okay. Have Gloria Tucker come and talk to us specifically about her side of it. Um, but yeah, so let me introduce this case study and then we can, you know, she is, um, she is a really hypermobile. So she's not been di di diagnosed, but I think she might be on the EDS spectrum. And um, she has an interesting history. She um, has not had any children. She's 48 now. And she was morbidly obese um, and had, um, a lot of issues, I, and I'm not sure there is a psychosomatic something that was going on. There's a lot of psychological issues, I think, behind the obesity um, that we didn't get completely in. I, she's given me hints about, I saw, I saw her first um, in person probably three years ago for a few visits, tried to get her back on the road. She presented with hip pain on her right. Um, was the primary complaint. She had had recently had um, surgery for weight reduction and basically then lost a lot of weight. I think she had a, a the stomach, the gastro tying. She lost a lot of weight and then her skin was so large around her that they had to go and sew her skin up. So basically she has scars down her arms, down her legs, right? And I, they're really prominent scars. And I think that that leads me to think even more that she's maybe on that EDS spectrum because people with Ehlers-Danlos also affects their skin and they, they scar a lot more easily. So I think the intention wasn't for her to have these large scars. And the other interesting thing, she, like I mentioned she's never had kids because she has pelvic floor issues with urinary incontinence, which also can relate to that hypermobility. And she's, she's come back to me. I've been seeing her virtually actually for probably two months now, once a week with me and once a week with the Pilates instructor kind of under my supervision as well. Um, and she's making great gains. It's really exciting. What we're trying to do is prevent a hip surgery or postpone a hip surgery for the time being anyway and give her access. She feels like she can't access the muscles around her right hip which I think is also related to the hip osteoarthritis. I see that even with somebody who's not hypermobile, but her case is particularly interesting, particularly interesting because of that hypermobility. So I was working with her um, and we have had to go back to the most basic things. Like she knows, she says, I can get through a Pilates workout. I can do the whole thing and I can do it entirely wrong and know that I'm doing it wrong and not know how to get to the right muscles. And one of our most interesting, so we do a little, I call it a little activation routine before we do anything bigger. Um, and one of the things that seems to be really effective in her case, two things, one is activating inner thighs, right? Gently activating. So we're talking about sort of that submaximal contraction. And I find in the hypermobile population, that's really key is getting activation with a submaximal contraction. So Basically, I have her lie down. We start lying down on the floor with her feet up on the box from the reformer and the little ball between her thighs just above her knees. And I have her start there with wrapping. So basically legs out, straight feet turning, wrapping inward, um, laying on her back. And just I don't even start with a strong wrap, 
much a very light press on the ball and then start activating into a little bit more of a wrap. And then we move into coccyx curl just with their legs extended out and elevated. And what's the interesting piece, I think that I wanted to share about that particular motion is that I was talking to one of our other flies, flies and I was working with her too. And I said, sometimes I feel like you have to be sneaky about what you're trying to do. So the fact that we're activating her inner thigh, she thinks it's just inner thigh work, but it's actually because I'm trying to get some activation in the pelvic floor, right? So if we start thinking about how muscles work and how they connect, then we can start cheating. I call it cheating to get what we want to happen to happen without the client having to go to their brain to do it and then mess it up because they're working too hard. So one of my favorite tricks in the book is just that really submaximal adductor squeeze to then activate the pelvic floor because then when she also lets go of the ball, the pelvic floor is also relaxing and she doesn't create this tension and this um, sensation around that whole pelvic floor and the whole history of the incontinence, all that doesn't come back. So it's really freeing for her actually. And it helps her, I, th I think, um, that getting the inner thighs active also really can help release those hip flexors to some extent, which is where she goes, especially on that right side to guard, which is, I think, again, very common in a hip osteoarthritis. Yeah. So, so actually we start there and then I actually do the same thing um, in a few directions. I have her go to her side with the ball and just light press. And then on her belly, I found, we use the, we call it glute series, Suzanne. I don't know if you're have the same naming, but basically prone, uh, prone work, double leg lifting, just barely off the floor, little Charlie Chaplin's, we call them little heel clicks. Um, and then I do, I do that kind of exercise almost every day. Yeah. Right. This is, I think they're great. Yeah. So, but I have her instead of, if I give her too much range, what I was trying to emphasize with the flies and structures working with today is that if I give her too much room to move, then everything moves. It really has to be more focused on that lengthening of the body and connecting through the body. And then we start to get the right motions. And then an interesting thing, and I, I wonder if you guys would have had any experience with this with her, is glute medius doesn't want to fire on that right side, which again, is I think part, partial with the hip osteoarthritis. So I've been cheating there too. And the cheating that I do there is I take her, uh, on the reformer a lot of times, or even in standing. And I have her start in turnout, little V or little V turnout. And I actually ask her for a wrap and ask for that piriformis activation to get the hip rotators firing. And then what happens there for her is it kind of gets her hips underneath her, gets her glutes underneath her hips. And then I have her go parallel again. And somehow she's able to maintain the length that that created and get a little bit more access to her glute medius. So um, I, it's cheating because we're using the rotators to do what we want glute medius to do. But, um, but then turning her back parallel seems to get us where, get her on, get those muscles on. So I'm curious to know if you guys have any other cheating ways or anything, any, what you think about cheating in that way <laughs> to get glute medius firing or what other tricks you might have up your sleeves there. Well, you know, I, I think um, two things. One is that um, uh, right now I use like the idea of kind of like sucking the limb into you because uh, right. one of the things that um, happened in my hip, I actually got a capsulitis. I think that's, oh. you know, I think it was like the tendonitis, the capsulitis plus the label tear. And then I'm just older. So there's some degeneration there now. But um, but now that it's, it's freeing up is, is I completely understand because it is the freakiest thing kind of losing that kind of contact with that kind of joint. But, um, but, you know, I was just telling her, well, the rotator cuff arm, you know, is what you do is, you know, is that it idea is it rotates to suck the limb into the socket because it's kind of lacking that congruency, you know, and that head mobility and, you know, whatever shape or joint is. And so in the hips too, to have that, I tell them to imagine there's like two bolts or two screws going through like the greater trochanter and that, and it's, it's actually kind of pulling it in. So instead of thinking of the adductors, it's more kind of the higher thigh that's helping to kind of press mm -hmm. inwards. So, so just as an imagery to, to use, mm -hmm. to use that. So instead of gripping, like you were saying, to get that sort of 
submaximal kind of holding. Like, how do you do that without just, you know, everything going to hell? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, that's, that's sort of a trick that I use with myself. And that um, also that uh, one of the things I work on in fascia is the deep fascial frontal line that goes from the mouth mm -hmm. to the throat and everything like that. It, it goes right past that area in the lower pelvic unit. And uh, mm -hmm. to imagine that the psoas is kind of pulling you up and that's sucking the, the socket and then that's pulling the limb. So starting mm -hmm. higher, you know, trying to access the fascial sling from the internal area. And frankly, you can do that with a smile. Oh, interesting, yeah. Yes, yes, that's I one thing I found out. That. Yeah, because yeah. that's a trick I love to do in conferences. Everybody stand up. <laughs> and sometimes in a math class, it's like smile, 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 smile. Okay, so the side, 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 smile, 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 side, side, side. And you can feel it inside yourself, you yeah. know, going up and down. Yeah. And so making I make fun of things to it's good. <laughs> get people to, you know, for my own self, lighten up some zone. It's like, you know, just so we can have a little fun sometimes. Yeah. And just yeah. that way too, it, it helps everybody have a little fun. But I think that's, I think it's wonderful. And that ties into what see, I was studying about this really eggheaded stecco stuff is that apparently there's something about right, like in the fourth and fifth, you know how both in your hand and our feet, we can move it like this. I know Elizabeth Thorakum does a lot of this kind of footwork, you know? And yes. so that actually ties into the spiral line of fascia. So you see, uh -huh. so you're just kind of going yeah. back and forth like that. And then I'm thinking if maybe try and see, I'm really curious, see if you could add on some of that imagery to get her to smile and then feel, just imagine the suction coming from inside. Yeah. And, you know, it's not that it's got to be like extreme ballet pull-up, you know, just to, right. just no, to think no, no, of but yeah. kind of pulling it. I, I think that's think what... Just zip the mm -hmm. jeans because it's almost not far enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's not far enough. I agree. And I think I, and I love using the spiral idea. I sometimes end it at the belly button, but I should carry it up yeah, even further, it I think. Way we go right up into the ribs. Here. Yeah, right yeah it's like this mm -hmm. you know, the connection into the diaphragm is like super high. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah short waisted. It's, you know, so that's, you know, so that's something that's helpful. You know, I'm into mm -hmm. a lot of the visceral aspect. And I think Pilates helps us, you know, because of all our breathing and things like that, helps us to get more into helping these little guys inside. Mm -hmm. But I think that's yeah. beautiful. Do you guys yeah. work in the same studio? We do. Yes, Kim and I do. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I work for Zaina. Zaina trained me and I work for Zaina. Okay, perfect. So. That's yeah, so cool. and I, I come I come to this with a very different background and a very different body type, actually. So it's quite interesting. I come mm -hmm. from a corporate back background, sitting at a desk. Well, you have to have stamina of. for that, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. <laughs> and um, and the exercising for myself, of course. And then on um, the hypermobility, I'm not. I'm just the opposite of that. And I actually hearing you, this conversation and others more recently makes me feel really <laughs> blessed <laughs> because no, I don't honestly, have it's a good thing. Any of that. I, you know, people say I'm not yeah. as flexible as you. I'm like, maybe that's all right. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, my pelvis doesn't go out of whack. My, you know, I, I don't have, I mean, I have little issues because I'm getting older too, but um, not, not like the, those that you have described. So I feel quite well, you know, blessed. Yeah, well, well, bless your heart for, because um, you have to say that when you move to this area, is that, um, <laughs> is that you know, because I think, I think sometimes unless you've been through it yourself, it's hard to understand. So I think it's, yeah. you're willing to kind of listen to this kind of hard stuff where it's coming from. And because um, I have one client that I'm working with, and he is, I should say he, is uh, someone who put himself in a wheelchair after having some foot injuries. And so now he identifies with, um, you know, that uh, the disabled uh, dance movers, you know, and uh, I've worked with him for about two years now and he's improved a lot, but man, it is an uphill battle, um, mm -hmm. you know, just to try and figure out how to get the stability. Do you work, do you ever encourage anybody to get prolotherapy? Do you know about that one, Kim? Because that can be really helpful for hypermobile people too. When you can identify, mm -hmm. like it helps if you really yeah. know specifically 
you know, yeah. if there's a ligament that needs kind of tightening up, um, it can be helpful. You have can also seen a few the- people with prolotherapy too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And tightening up. Um, we do have quite a few clients who have done it. Um, and I've seen mixed results with it. I think, right. yeah, it has to be really specific. Uh, we have one, I have one client right now who is doing it for his shoulder. Uh, he's a high, he's an EDS on the EDS spectrum. And he had recurrent subluxation of the shoulder, left shoulder. Uh, and it's, they've decided to finally do some prolotherapy, see if they can tighten up that shoulder so that he doesn't have to suffer all the time. He's in a lot of pain from it because sure. it's constantly in and out, even par- partially in and out of position. Um, so I'm curious to see how this will go for him because he's 20 and younger than anybody Mm. I've seen. Yeah. I haven't seen many people that age doing prolotherapy and I've more, more seen women than men um, doing it more for SI joint than anywhere else. So I'm curious to see how he will, how he'll do actually. Yeah. Do you ever help somebody with the nutritional aspects? I mean, I know we're not dietitians, Mm -hmm. but do do you know about the CUSEC protocol? I don't know the CUSEC protocol. Yeah. So one of my clients um, who's hypermobile, she um, does a lot of research on all this. And so she found this. And this is actually a family of people who are hypermobile. And it's a last name. It's C-U-S-A-C-K and protocol. So you have to take it with a grain of salt, but you know, there's um, certain things because nutritionally it's really helpful. I know, cause you know, I was working with Smew and Ballet for about the last 25 years. Yeah. And so, you know, for a lot of dancers and I gave nutrition lectures at school at San Francisco Ballet for about six or seven years. But when I work with, with dancers, lots of times I try to get them to start taking a collagen supplement. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, okay, there's probably some defect in our collagen or that we don't have like the right, con- you know, like the right combination. There's so many levels of it. But, um, but uh, that's one thing that I promote. And there's lots of good ones out there, you know, with uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Axe, you know, Josh Axe, I think is it. Um, I think I do vital, vital proteins because it doesn't taste like much. Um, but, um, but, all, but the COSAC protocol really talks about things like... Um, because sometimes there's a mast cell syndrome associated with it, you know, again, some kind of inflammatory thing. Um, mm-hmm. Then also really trying to get them to check their protein. So sometimes I get clients to go to actual a registered dietitian and I tell them, look, they say, I'm eating enough. I'm like, look, Google it, find out how much protein is in all this stuff. An average woman needs like 40 grams a day and I'm small. I mean, I don't think I quite get enough of that, but just changing my diet, taking that for years and taking enough vitamin D, you know, that's something that's been proven that, um, that it can go in, help, you know, push people into these sort of autoimmune situations. Um, mm-hmm. So, and then I have one client who is really overweight and she uh, was going to have to have a, uh, a tibial tendon transfer. So that's the, the in, inside of your arch, um, you know how it falls in Kim in pronation. Well, hers was like severe and she was, and she was in a wheelchair and I said, look, can you come up ramping up four steps? You can't come yet. <laughs> you know, but it, um, when she came in, you know, we had the hard conversation. I said, look, if you don't lose weight, like you're not going to, this is, you're not going to succeed. And uh, it took her four years to lose a hundred pounds. And, um, and she didn't hadn't have to have the operation, but she is unbelievably hypermobile. And, um, but she did, she had to change her diet severely. Um, and then it was really difficult because she was going to some gym. She was living in San Francisco at the time and she went to the gym and some lady came up to her and said, honey, I noticed that she lost a bunch of weight. And she said, yeah, I lost a hundred pounds. You know, the lady looked at her and said, what's your goal weight? <laughs> and oh my God, I was like, you bitch. You know, it's, <laughs> um, and, I, and, she, and so then the woman looked at me and she says, you know, I lost all this weight, I'm not happy. I said, look, you run with both feet to your psychologist, you have got to get this under control or, you know, like we're not going anywhere. And, but, you know, she has worked hard on it. Um, so I don't know, I've worked with other, I'm working with her mother now who's also obese and had the operation, but you know, it's, um, 
yeah, it's, it's such tricky business. It's trying to get mm-hmm. enough nutrition and um, not to get mm-hmm. too much and um, trying to figure out what's the right things. And like you're saying, as we get older, um, my husband, we say fortunately or unfortunately, um, he doesn't eat flour, um, <laughs> sugar or dairy. And so that helps me out. Um, but I've gotten really good at paleo recipe, baking recipes, <laughs> but, um, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's hard to be different and have somebody who's mm-hmm. young and have it that impacted, like you're saying 20. Yeah. He's, I've sent him to a nutrition, a registered dietitian oh, who's good. also a nutritionist. Uh, there's a lot. Um, and he has a family history of also gaining weight, which obviously for the hypermobile population, I think that's the, to detriment. It's a huge detriment to have too much weight on the body when it's already structurally uh, struggling. Uh, not able to hold itself. So um, he's working really hard at it. It's great to see um, that he's that committed. Uh, he's somebody who wants to come around, but th- that's not always the case. You know, they, they don't, they don't, they want it, but not badly enough. And, and so they start and then they drop off and then they start and then they drop off. So those are, it's challenging. Yeah. yeah but it I, is. I think, um, I think nutrition is super important and I was glad to hear you bring up the collagen. It's something that I'd like to look into more, especially, um, there's so much, um, contra in information out, out there, I think about some people will say, oh, you don't need that much protein after all. And, and, but I think in the, in, I would say in women, perimenopause, menopause, um, athletic who are hypermobile, I think that's especially, I think protein and collagen are huge um, necessities. And I think that there's, I don't think there's that much research on that out there. I don't know if you've seen any um, really interesting research out there, but um, I haven't seen anything that's really definitive or. um, They're always going to argue because there's never enough evidence, you know, but, you know, I've done a lot of um, uh, tour into Asia, you know, for um, teaching and stuff. And so, um, I convinced my husband and he was on with it is that he actually buys chicken feet and boils it down for me. And, you know, and in Asia, they call it double boiled soup. And so, you know, we ch- chicken soup is like fab, right? I mean, it's in my opinion, I hope you're not a vegetarian, Kim, is, no. that, is, is, that, is that, you know, um, but, you know, to really, um, to really get that collagen completely down. And I think that that helps a lot too. And I think that's why so many nice places like in Berkeley, there's like three stone hearth and stuff all these places now that have all of this bone broth, you know, and that's Mm -hmm. why I think it, you know, is super helpful for us to get, um, we're calling it bone broth. Uh, I had a dancer who had a stress fracture. Honestly, that sucker was a good fourth of an inch in her tibia. And uh, Erica just, and she had been a homeopathic student. She boiled so many, she baked and boiled so many bones and she, she got better. She got better. (laughs) I mean, she really did. Of course, we're talking like a young person who's super motivated. And um, yeah, she just had these hypermobile knees that, I mean, it was just never going to like be right um, in her ankles and stuff. Uh, So um, yeah, and she's fine now. She's a little retired. I mean, but she has her own dance Mm -hmm. studio. But it's, um, Mm -hmm. but you know, nutrition does a lot and it's a hard convincing thing. But I think if we just look to the evidence and you also have just so, so far out that people like, this is so complicated that I don't think I can handle it, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, just trying to stick to, you know, kind of good nutritional basics, but just knowing mm-hmm. that there's some things that we can tweak to make it just a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, do you, I think Suzanne, you probably have to go in a couple of minutes, but um, yeah, have to any see. last thoughts or questions or anything that, well, I, you know, I didn't mean to like dominate this whole thing, but I just happened to come on a day when I was full of what you were talking about, you know, yeah. it's just, uh, <laughs> I'm so happy to have you. Usually there's a few more people in and there weren't today, which is sometimes really nice, but so happy to have you. I was actually just looking at um, a course that you're doing soon on scoliosis. I just got the information on that course. And I actually talked to my husband about you today because we also went and saw the Smolin Ballet not that long ago. Um, I think it was last, just before COVID, uh, last Christmas before, right before. Um, oh, Christmas Ballet, 
<laughs> I know. Um, it's because we had a friend who was in it. But um, anyway, so you had come up in conversation and here you are. So it's really great to have you. Um, yeah, I really you, appreciate you, you yeah. dropping in. Yeah. yeah. I just finished with this last group of people that was studying spinal asymmetry. And yeah, we had people from Indonesia and the UK and you know, in the mm-hmm. summer, I think it's people from Switzerland. And yeah, so it's, yeah, mm-hmm. it's fun. It's nice to hear from around the world, kind of like how people do things. And I know it's kind of, yeah. you know, just like you having this every time, it, it's kind of a push to kind of attend some of this stuff. Yeah. Anyway, it's nice yeah. to meet you guys. Nice, nice to meet you too. Yeah. Thanks for joining. We'll yeah. to see you again. But I finally got to get to one. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm glad you made it. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, by the way. Really nice that you do this. Oh, thank you. Thank you.